On behalf of the Drug Information Association, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar titled From the Clinic to CFO, Adaptive Trials and Financial Decision Making. This solution provider webinar is brought to you by DIA in cooperation with SciTel. After the webinar is complete, you will receive an email containing an online survey link. DIA is committed to the developing quality educational programs that meet the needs of its members. Your feedback is greatly appreciated as the results of these online surveys are used to plan future programs. Questions and answers will be taken after today's presentation, but please feel free to submit your questions at any time by using the question and answer box. The question and answer box is located in the lower right-hand corner of the screen. Today our speakers are Nitin Patel, Chairman, Founder, and CTO of Cytel Inc., and Frank David, Managing Director of Pharmagellan. At this time, I would like to turn our webinar over to Frank, and everyone can enjoy the webinar. Frank, you do have control of the PowerPoint presentation at this time. Right. Thanks so much. Um, again, my name is Frank David. Really happy to be here. Just as a brief intro to give some context, um, I'm a consultant who works primarily in the commercial uh, business development and R&D strategy sides of, uh, of life sciences organizations and um, come at this from previously a history of, uh, of clinical medicine and basic science, and then many years as a consultant uh, within an investment bank, and then a couple of years uh, in an industry R&D position uh, doing R&D strategy uh, in oncology. Um, Nitin will do his intro in a second, but you know, in a few minutes, but really this whole idea came together because we found that our perspectives on uh, clinical development decision maker making kind of intersected at an interesting point. So I come at clinical development decision making more from a business strategy, financial analytics, uh, and partnering perspective. Nitin, as he'll talk about in a few minutes, comes at it more from an R&D trial design and trial execution perspective and portfolio management perspective, and those two things come together. And that's really what we want to spend this talking about is really to to explore what's interesting about that intersection between trial design on the one hand and financial and corporate strategy on the other hand, um, and really how those can be used in novel ways both in small companies and in large companies. So let's go to the next slide. Um, I could say a few words. Oh, yeah, sure. Maybe Nitin will introduce himself first. Sorry. Just a few words. You wanted to add to Jennifer. Uh, Jessica's introduction that uh, I have a PhD from MIT in operations research and I'm a fellow of the American Statistical Association. Uh, I've been interested in adaptive designs for some time. I've been involved in developing software and tools and doing some consulting in that area. And uh, I have been particularly active with the DIA Adaptive Design Scientific Working Group, which uh, as you know, has done a lot of very interesting work in making adaptive designs uh, really practical uh, and to use and checking out the pros and cons in various uh, studies. Uh, I've been interested in the, I have an MBA also, so I've been interested in the financial side and it's really for my first paper, I guess I published more than uh, what, 10 years ago, perhaps eight years ago, on uh, trying to link uh, design statistical clinical trial design with what the financial outcomes would be, risk and return, to uh, sponsor companies. So that's just my real background. Great. And just I'll make one final note, which is um, the work that we're talking about today, there are some other collaborators who we've had along the way, Note, and I just wanted to especially call out um, several collaborators from Ernst & Young's Life Sciences Consulting Division. Um, who were enormously helpful and did, uh, did some of the analyses here, as well as some collaborators that we've had within uh, large pharma R&D organizations who have helped us both in terms of framing the questions and in terms of some of the inputs. Good. So with that background, um, uh, I think we're, we're, we missed one. Oh, we are we're missing a slide. That's okay. So go back. So, you know, I think that... that that's fine. Stop. Um, there are there are some interesting 
questions, both from the point of view of being inside a company that's developing drugs and also being an outsider looking in in terms of um, uh, potentially funding these drug development uh, efforts. And they do come together in some ways. So these are some examples of the kinds of things that probably a lot of you have heard um, in terms of strategic questions within a company that's actually trying to develop, uh, develop drugs. And inherently, there are uh, several trade-offs that need to be made in terms of speed, the cost of running the R&D, the probability of success, um, and also the, the ability to, over time, be able to manage your risk. Um, if you think about it, actually, those are much the same, many of the same kinds of concerns that you have as an investor. And by investor here, we can use that kind of in a broader sense to mean both an external investor, so you know, many people would call it, quote, unquote, a VC. This might not actually be a venture capitalist, but someone who's putting financial capital at work to get financial returns. Or you have the chief financial officer of a, of a biopharma organization. That person's interests are a little bit different. They're clearly putting financial capital to, to, to work. They want to get financial returns, but they also want strategic returns as well. Um, going back to the financial question, again, whether you're the CFO looking at this through a financial lens or whether you're an extra, potential external investor, though, there are really four fundamental problems with investing in clinical development as it's conventionally done. Um, the first is it's just really expensive. I mean, there's just no getting around it. Um, the second is it takes a really long time. And the third is that it's unbelievably risky. And when you put all those together, you get to the fourth problem which is essentially that as a financial, from a financial perspective, you're locking up your investment for a long period of time in something that's high risk. And essentially, you're being told that at some distant point in the future, someone will tell you what you won, if anything. And um, anyone who's, if any of you have thought about this from a financial perspective, you realize those are all the makings of a really bad investment um, because Really, what investors want are the ability to understand risk, to modulate risk, to not have their money locked up in things in which they don't have an understanding of the, of the investment for a long period of time. So that really um, unites, in many ways, the kinds of issues that both the financial investors, the extra potential external financial investors, but also internal financial stress slash strategic investors have when they look at R&D. So... Um, so really, what we would like to do here is, you know, we are missing several of the slides. Um, keep going. Yeah, we are missing every other slide. That's right. Jessica, actually, if you look at the numbers. Okay. Every, uh, every other slide is gone um, from the file that I sent. Okay, let me just give me one second and I will take this out and re-upload it. Thank you. Sure. Sorry for that. I'll, I'll just riff a little bit while, because um, I can carry on without the, uh, without the slide, so I hope people will just bear with me. Um, you know, really there are three fundamental challenges that we've been, uh, that we've been, that Nitin and I have been working on, and we do believe that putting uh, financial analytics together with adaptive trial design, we can help get over those three challenges. So the first one is that fundamentally the quote-unquote financial investors, again, whether it's the internal uh, C-suite, the CFO, et cetera, or whether it's potential external investors, often don't understand that there is, in fact, a relationship between trial design and what they would normally look at as financial metrics. The return, the return on investment, the, um, the internal rate of return, et cetera. Um, In fact, the you know, trial designs rarely talk about dollar signs. It's always about power and significance. And absolutely. Nowhere is there a dollar sign. Absolutely. And I would say, that in my experience, the only place a dollar sign is mentioned is just talking about the total cost, right? So, so traditionally, if you're in a large, for any of you who have been in large pharma companies or are in large pharma companies, you will recognize the situation of essentially, you know, going to kiss the ring and showing your trial design and saying, therefore, we want X amount of money to be able to do trial design Y. And that's very unsatisfying for both internal, uh, quote, unquote, investors as well as, um, as well as external investors. 
Um, so one of the keys is really finding ways to better integrate both the trial planning with the analysis of relevant financial metrics that matter to the people who are actually deciding whether to fund the trial. So that's part one. And again, although adaptive design is not necessarily required for that, um, it does, as we'll talk about in a second, give you more degrees of freedom in terms of, uh, in terms of doing that. The second issue is that we talked a moment ago about the different, um, uh, about the different um, types of concerns that investors have. And one of the challenges is that often when the R&D organization goes and tries to, quote, unquote, design a trial, there's often little insight in terms of what actually are the pressing needs in terms of the financial decision makers. Is the pressing need in this case managing the cost? Is it managing the risk? Is it increasing the total value of the program? Is it getting there faster? Mm -hmm. What is the burning desire? And so that also is, a, um, is something where uh, adaptive design, again, is not critical to that, but if you understand that and if you have actually that transparent discussion of what the strategic goals are, then adaptive design helps you to enable and to sort of maximize for that variable. I would say the third thing really is, comes to the heart of what we're going to be talking about in this program, which is that um, the chief financial officer and the investors often view R&D as a, tra as a little bit less attractive as an opportunity in part because they are presented one option to basically vote up or down that is unattractive for the reasons I just described. And really that comes to the heart of what Nit and I want to talk about, which is that by using adaptive design and really iteratively going back and forth between adaptive design and um, the financial analytics, one can actually not just develop options, but actually analyze and refine, uh, refine them and make them investable. Okay, I'm going to take a second while we figure out whether we have all the slides. This is looking extremely promising. Excellent. So this is a slide I missed with the beautiful graphics on the left. So we'll just give that due homage and then we can keep going. One more. So this is what I was just talking about. Um, again, the problems that Nit and I have been wrestling with and really trying to solve. And then on the next slide, this is really the structure for the remainder of the presentation. So we actually have two case studies that we're going to show that talk about how one can link adaptive trial to financial decision making. So in the first one that Nitin's going to present, this is one which stemmed from a biotech company that was really trying to manage risk and cost and try to make its trial more quote unquote investable. And Nitin will talk about the strategic questions and also how um, how his team helped to solve those, uh, solve those questions for, uh, for the company. In the second case, uh, I'm going to present a little bit on, uh, on a case that actually came from a larger pharma company, which was really in terms of helping to understand and define what the trade-offs were between cost and benefit um, for an R&D decision-making uh, organization. Um, now, one final point I'll make just before we, before we get into the cases is that although one of these is more of a small company, is an example taken from a small company, and the other is an example taken from a large company, actually the issues that are raised, raised are totally transferable back and forth. Um, because again, the central question about the fact of um, trying to come up with designs and ways of analyzing the designs that can bridge the gap between R&D and investment really transcend whether you're at a small company, a large company, looking at internal investment or external investment. So with that, I will uh, turn it over to Nitin and we'll go through this first case study. Uh, thanks, Frank. Uh, this case study, as uh, Frank said, is about a small biotech and let me give you some context about it. Uh, they had a pivotal trial that they were designing for a lead asset. The asset actually had promise for many other indications than the one that uh, the pivot trial is focused on. Uh, but they had limited resources, and they wanted to explore what could be done in terms of getting external investment to enable them to do justice to the asset that they did have. So the goals that they set, uh, apart from the usual goals of clinical trials, were to see if a one could have a staged trial investment so that investors could somehow de-risk 
or appear to to take less risks in their minds uh, than uh, would be the case if they just simply agreed on a share of the standard fixed design. And also to clearly indicate in financial language, which is quite different from our, the statistical language that we are used to as good trial designers, uh, the risk and reward profile uh, for that trial, in particular to the investors, and make it attractive to them and actually negotiate in such a way as to see whether one could come with terms that would be attractive to both parties. So the company is actually Solisis Pharmaceuticals. This is all public data that I'm using, so uh, uh, you can go on the web and find much of this information. This is a poster from ASCO, for example. Uh, it's a, the study was the Rather study. Uh, that was the name of the uh, candidate drug. And the idea was to have a, a double-blind randomized clinical trial of Vataroxin, which is the study drug, and the indication was first relapsed or refractory AML, acute myeloid uh, leukemia. Uh, the idea was to have a one-to-one -one randomization, a two-arm study between a study arm and a control arm. The study arm uh, involved treatment with Vataroxin, the study drug, and uh, the, the standard of care, Cytrobine. And the control was the study of care, uh, standard of care and placebo. Uh, they went through treatments, induction and consolidation cycles, and then patients were followed up uh, for overall survival, which was the endpoint that uh, they were looking at and which was agreed upon with the FDA. Incidentally, the drug was, uh, Vosorexin was considered an orphan drug and had fast-track status. So they would have that advantage. I, I would just make one quick point there, which is, um, you know, I think one reason why oncology is particularly interesting for the types of approaches we're talking about is, as many of you probably know, oncology more and more is going after smaller indications, at least initially, and the kinds of metrics that you would, that would have been used historically 15 years ago to figure out should we run our big trial for a lipid lowering agent, for example, the numbers at the end in terms of the potential market size are so much smaller that um, that it becomes challenging to make sort of conventional uh, the math work out with a with conventional trial design. So again, I don't think that we're making the point that that this is really only suitable for these kinds of situations, but I do think there's, there are unique aspects of smaller indications that make them particularly interesting for the types of trial designs and, and pairing with financial analytics that we've been working on. Thanks, Frank. <clears throat> so the first cut is, was a, a standard fixed sample size design, the two-arm trial that I showed earlier, uh, and uh, we company had been hoping to have a hazard ratio of 0.71. So when you power a trial, 90% power trial, with that hazard ratio, you get 450 patients accrued over 24 months and 375 events, uh, which seemed uh, reasonable to them in terms of the resource demands it would take. But uh, the worry was that it was possible that they were a bit optimistic in the hazard ratio, and that's not uncommon. There were papers published, particularly in oncology, in the British Medical Journal, about uh, how it's natural that people would be optimistic on compounds that they're working on. Uh, but it does lead to some distortions in the trial design. So here, uh, the worry was that the hazard ratio could be as low as 0.77, and in that case, that particular design of 450 patients dropped down to 70%. Uh, and uh, if they try to jack it up to 90% at that hazard ratio, uh, it requires 60% more patients. So that's quite a large number of patients, and they felt 372, uh, 730 patients or something like that, and they felt it was too much uh, to take on up front. So they wanted to avoid incurring that high cost upfront. And only if the assumption that we were making about the hazard ratio of 0.71, if it turned out to be optimistic to look for a safety net, which would somehow allow them to uh, adjust the sample size. So, so the question was, can we have an adaptive design which reduces upfront cost? And could it also 
provide ways in which by de-risking and making clear what the costs and investments, uh, what the costs and returns are to investors, uh, allow them to uh, to invest in the trial. And just to add one point there, I think this whole question about reducing the amount of investment until you have a better sense of what the risk is, um, again, in our experience, is the kind of discussion that doesn't go on very much in larger organizations either, but really could and should. Um, that that would be an attractive way of talking about how to design a trial from a strategic perspective, that you're basically buying the right to, be, to get more information to decide whether you want to invest more later. Now, before I jump into the adaptive design, I thought I'd say a few words for this as a refresher of connecting the probability of success with the true hazard ratio of a compound. So, for example, we've been talking about a compound in which we're thinking about that it would have a hazard ratio of 0.71, and when we took the sample size of 450, you got a power of 90%, which is, which is equivalent to probability of success of 90% at that hazard ratio. However, if it, uh, the hazard ratio goes down, the efficacy is down, you have a worse hazard ratio of 0.77, the property of success goes, goes down quite a bit to 0.7, and of course it keeps going down as the hazard ratio gets worse. So <clears throat> one thing to keep in mind, which is pretty obvious, I suppose, but uh, worth uh, keeping in mind, is the fact that the efficiency if you have a hazard ratio which, or a compound which has lesser efficiency than you thought, you're going to lose probability of success and it could be quite substantial. The, uh, this slide shows what happens, but we can really buy probability of success, but that is at the cost of increasing sample size. In this case, uh, we saw that if we had a hazard ratio of 0.77, uh, we could bump up the probability of success from point from 70% to 90%, but that's a bit higher as a ratio. To unmute your line, um, press star six or pound to, six. To me, this is actually one of the central disconnects between how R&D organizations understand almost intuitively this, this aspect of trial design, and yet financial decision makers and investors, A, do not fund, although if you presented it this way, can I get more probability of success by adding more patients? I think all of them would say, yes, that's obvious, but they've never really thought about it that much. More importantly, um, they've never actually been presented with the opportunity to figure out what that math looks like. Well, if we spend X amount more, the probability of success goes up to Y. If we spend Z amount more, the probability of success goes up to A. And that, again, it, giving that level of, finance, of analytics that really connects the trial design to the financials is, is something that is extremely enabling, both when you're talking about an external investor, as we're talking about here, but also if you're talking about an internal, quote, unquote, investor or decision maker. Yeah, and as you say, it's a, it's a key bridge to be crossed really between these two uh, different uh, groups. And it's... If you don't do that, you really cannot connect design with financial trade-offs. You just need to have groups. The decision analyst groups often uh, will simply work with the probability of success irrespective of the design. And that's, uh, right. you know, that's assuming that they have a certain budget and there'll be a design made with a certain power, not that, with, especially with adaptive designs where there is all kinds of, you know, cost can be very different. Uh, yeah. It is not factored into the picture except in an ad hoc way sort of uh, on the back of an envelope. But one does have what we're trying to show, Frank and I, is that there is a way to bring an explicit connection between these two. Uh, the, so now that we get to the design itself, the design is actually a uh, adaptive design with a uh, planned increase in sample size, all pre-planned. And uh, uh, any adaptive design, it's adapted by design, so it is all pre-planned. All the adaptations are pre-planned. They're set out in the protocol and uh, in the statistical analysis plan well before the trial uh, is actually launched. Uh, so what was this adaptive design? It was basically the same 450 trial, fixed design, 450 subject trial that we talked about. Uh, I'm represented by this planned end bar here. 
But the adaptive element came in with an interim analysis, and the interim analysis occurred at half, when half the number of events had been observed. In other words, you gathered half the information that the trial would have given if it had gone to completion. So at that point, it looks like we have enough information to make some reasonable decisions. Uh, going too early would make it uh, sort of debatable whether the value is good. Uh, going too late makes it not really very attractive because it's too late and you have to, uh, you have to do more drastic things to bring in modifications. So we have an interim analysis. What do we do at that interim analysis? We, uh, we calculate the most important thing we do is the DSMB calculates uh, the, uh, the conditional power. And what's the conditional power? The conditional power is simply the probability of success projected from the existing data that is visible right now. The 187 events gives us some information at the interim, and that's what is used to project, to calculate the conditional power, which says, what is the chance that we will show significance at the end of the trial as conceived with the, with the original 450 patients if we just continue to that end? And if it looks like we already have enough information to demonstrate significance, uh, we have a high conditional power that's reflected our high conditional power, uh, we can stop for efficacy. And that's, of course, the best of all possible worlds. We've cut our trial size by half and demonstrated what we wanted to demonstrate. On the other hand, if we have a very low conditional power, uh, then we would not be happy about continuing the trial. It would be futile. It, it looks like it's virtually impossible to get such good results in the remaining half that they will swamp the bad results we've seen so far. So that is a cutoff that is established in the design uh, for futility. And then there is an interesting zone in between what uh, Cyrus calls the promising zone. And uh, this zone uh, consists of values of the conditional power, uh, which are promising in that if only we increase the sample size, we could show demonstration. So in our context, uh, we could show demonstration for point uh, hazard of ratio of 0.77 as opposed to 0.71, where he had a small chance of doing so, by increasing sample size. And the idea was, well, let's add 50% more patients, so 225 more patients will be added. And so if you land up in this promising zone in the interim, you wind up ending not at the planned end, but at an end with an increased sample size and an increased number of events. So that's the, the, the broad design of uh, the trial. And it, uh, although the cutoffs are uh, are not available to us. Uh, we have uh, done some simulations to show what, uh, what kind of results we might expect, which I will show you in the next slide. So here, as I said, we've used the cutoffs, which uh, the, the trial is actually running, and uh, so uh, it's blinded. Uh, we are, the cutoffs are not, uh, not known. But we were able to do an analysis by playing around with the cutoffs, and uh, Looking at the presentation made at the DIA by uh, Cyrus Mehta and uh, Stephen Ketchum uh, of Synesis. And it's interesting to see we ran 10,000 simulations uh, using yeast and using uh, the CHW method to control type 1 error, which is well accepted by the FDA. And uh, the, we see that if you look at the results, are quite interesting. If you look at the hazard ratio for 0.77, which we are worried about, we see that we have been able to get the power up to 80% from 70%, which is good. And the good thing is that the sample size has increased from 450, but not dramatically, so it's kind of doable. It looks reasonable to do. Uh, it's gone up to 530 in the worst case, but it could be 490. So we do pay a bit of price if HR is 0.71, going to be adaptive. But an important point to remark is if HR is 0.71, you do have a 26% chance of stopping early, which would be, as I said, that would be the best of all possible worlds if you stop early for efficacy. And there is the futility part, which is also important from the point of de-risking the trial, getting an early readout, as Frank was saying. So that this is these are the elements of the design performance which uh, are attractive. Uh, they were attractive enough to have a strategic impact. 
the remember the the objective was to have state investment with the interim result and the various forks from the interim analysis uh, laid out give us. Uh, they were actually able to use that to give us the trial sufficiently to get Royalty Pharma, an external investor, uh, to decide to participate in the trial through investments. But participate in a conditional way depending on what happens at the interim. So that this table here summarizes the, the agreement that uh, Royalty Pharma made with Synesis. Uh, depending on the internal result, they, there's a different level of participation. We stop for efficacy early. Uh, Royalty Pharma would make a $25 million milestone payment and earn 3.6% royalty on the revenue stream that comes from the compound. If, on the other hand, there was futility, then they made no payments at all. So you can see right there, there is a kind of gate keeping in terms of not incurring certain risk. This one lines up in that blue promising zone, and the decision is to increase sample size, then the milestone payment amount is the same. However, it bumps up the royalty that the royalty farmer receives. It goes up from 3.6 to 6.75, and there are additional warrants, which are options for uh, buying stock, amounts of stock, at uh, attractive strike prices. And if none of these happen, and we just continue recruiting as planned to 450 patients, then the option is to invest 25 million. But this is an option now. They don't have to. Obviously, they would, because the, the option is exercisable upon unblinding, which means that you would know pretty well uh, whether it was a success or not after the trial. Uh, so that's a nice option to have. So that basically made the idea of investing those 25 million uh, attractive enough uh, for Royalty Pharma to actually go ahead with the agreement. And uh, Sunisis uh, had, had, uh, had found a way to hedge the possibility of having a low as an unfavorable hazard ratio. So I just want to make, uh, I think there's one important point to be made here, which is um, this makes it look like everything came together perfectly and the light shone down on the particular point in space and this was the answer. Whereas, in fact, this is a very dynamic and iterative process. There are, there's an infinite number of ways to solve the equation, so to speak. Um, you know, Nitin talked a little bit about even where to put that interim analysis point. Um, how big to have the trial be initially? How many to how um, how many sam how many to add if you're in the promising zone? How to set those cutoffs? And then finally, how to set what the payout what the what the agreement is from the investor point of view in terms of how much they're going to pay, how much they would receive. There's there are countless ways to solve this equation and. The only way that you actually can get to this point is by having a transparent link between the trial design and the financial analytics so that you can go back and forth and you can have that conversation so that, you know, again, without, without, without having been in the room, obviously, and knowing how that conversation goes, you can imagine the biotech says, well, look, we can only put up X amount to start to kick off the trial. That's the maximum we could invest in this first stage. Okay, so that helps to define certain things. And then maybe the financial investor says, look, even in the best case scenario, you know, the amount of money that we want to invest is between X and Y. And so they've sort of set some boundary conditions there. Um, and we need to see a royalty between A and B to be able to make this kind of worth our while in terms of putting our money to work. Um, those kinds of things are very idiosyncratic. They're going to differ, but they're, they're, they're going to be different depending on the strategic investor, the, the, the biotech. They're going to differ depending on the financial investor. Um, they're going to differ based on the individual uh, compound and disease area, et cetera. But by doing the analytics so that you can iteratively back and forth test different trial designs under certain parameters, figure out what the financial implications are, and tweak back and forth, you can land on a solution like this, which you never would have been able to land on otherwise. And 
you know, I think when you look at deals that get done in biopharma, one of the reasons you don't see this very often is it's just hard. It's, it's, not, it's not trivial. And actually, conversely, if you look at the deals that do get done in biopharma and you ask, well, how did they come to those deal terms? Didn't they do that same type of analysis? It's just they didn't use an adaptive trial. And the answer is no. Often it's a lot more hand-waving um, and somewhat qualitative in terms, of, in terms of how the link was made between the clinical situation and quote-unquote value. This is a much more explicit linkage, very well suited to these situations in which you're trying to get investment around an individual trial as opposed to in an asset or in a company. And for that reason, not only is it interesting in terms of potentially opening up new avenues for biotechs, but also in a pharma company, that essentially is the situation every day. When you go to the leadership team and you are asking for funding, you're typically saying, we want X amount of money to run this next trial. And so that's why we actually think that this type of analysis could also be useful in large companies. One small point to add also is that, you know, there's a, I put down things which look like they explicitly connected only to the trial. But for example, if you look at the royalty stream of royalty pharma, that is negotiating, is nego underlying that is the ability to earn money not just from this indication, from subsequent indications. And uh, this is a point of great interest to uh, companies where you have multiple indication possibilities for the same compound. Yeah, and I think that that also just, you know, one of the pieces of an analysis that gets done in the background here, again, whether you're a small company or a large company, is actually having some agreement about what the commercial assumptions are as well, which, again, in many R&D organizations, there's not a very, there's not a lot of thought given at least at early stages um, to really getting everyone to agree on those commercial uh, assumptions. Um, and in this case, you actually need to get some better alignment around those, especially if you're going to talk about sort of value down the line. Great. So let me uh, go to the next slide, which is a more concrete uh, illustration of the kind of financial language one needs to have to be able to talk to external investors. Uh, this is a slide which represents the risk and reward profile for Sumisis, the graph for hazard ratio of 0.77, our pessimistic hazard ratio. And uh, what I've got here is on the x-axis is the 10-year net revenue. We got these figures for cost and revenue. Uh, we were fortunate enough to have access to uh, reports by Leading Swan. There were equity research reports by Leading Swan analyzing this particular trial and the impact it might have on the revenue stream and earnings of the company, of Sunesis. And we got a hold of that. They were fortunately detailed enough. They went out to 10 years of revenue. And we were able to blend it into the design uh, where we had some indication of the structure of the design, although we didn't know the cutoffs, as I mentioned earlier. So we put those two together, and uh, this time uh, with those 10,000 simulations, uh, we were able to draw these curves, which are pretty valuable to investors to look at, because what we have here is, uh, is two curves. One, these are curves relating to returns to Sumesis, the net revenue, 10 year net revenue to Sumesis, for, for a fixed design, the red curve, and the blue design is the uh, is the adaptive curve. And you notice that uh, the, and what you have on the y-axis uh, is the probability of exceeding that level of net revenue. So for example, if you look at a net revenue of 500,000, then you see that the probability of exceeding 500,000 is, the blue curve is higher, so probability is some 10% higher than it is for the fixed design. And on the other hand, if you look at the, uh, the high end of this, uh, the, the fixed design doesn't go above 800,000, for example. It stops short of that. Whereas the interim stop and the early, early success of the interim allows for the possibility of having quite a large 10-year uh, revenue, uh, which would not have been possible with the traditional design, obviously. And uh, so these bumps here represent those various stopping points. This one here is because the sample size increased, uh, it allowed you to increase the probability, to reduce the probability of failure, increase the probability of success. You notice at zero, the blue curve is above the red curve. So the 
and this is due to the increase in power from 70 to 80 percent. The odds of incurring a loss have gone down from 41 percent to 25 uh, percent. On the other hand, there is this gap here where the fixed design is doing better than the adaptive design, and that is because this is when we're talking about stopping with the original sample size. So if you're going to stop with the original sample size anyway, you might as well have not bothered about all the other uh, paraphernalia you introduced to the adaptive design. And in that case, there's a gap here between the blue and red curves reflecting the fact that the royalty pharma has to be paid and in the case of the blue curve, but not in the case of the red curve. So this is, a, this is a snapshot of what you would see with a hazard ratio of 0.77. There's, of course, a hazard ratio of 0.71, which you could do this. More often, you would use a, a Bayesian trial on the hazard ratios, if you had many more complex factors, to put this all together into an overall curve showing the risk and return. Yeah. And, and just two quick points on this. First of all, um, you know, fundamentally, I think even just showing this curve is just so critically important because it's actually not a way, although in, finance, in the finance world, in the investment world, people think this way about probabilities of different risks and rewards. In larger biopharma organizations, typically these things all get boiled down into a single number. What's the EIRR of the program? What's the NPV? Which masks out the probabilities. And from a financial investment point of view, um, this is just so much of a richer <laughs> set of information to be able to base decisions on that nobody who's really in the financial investment world would ever think about making decisions based on the kind of collapsed information that we're typically used to using in pharma. Um, if you, and then the second point I would just make is if you're interested in this topic, there's a great book called The Flaw of Averages by a guy named Sam Savage, and he talks about this pretty extensively. I recommend it. It's really, um, I, I think this is fundamentally, um, it gets to one of the points I talked about at the outset about really getting the R&D arm of the organization and the finance arm of the organization to really talk the same language. And if you look at the, this last bullet here, uh, well, if you look overall, you saw the situations where uh, solutions comes off better and the situations where it comes off worse with the adaptive design. Uh, overall, for this hazard ratio, uh, it does come up with a, with a higher, the adaptive design does deliver a higher expected net, risk, net revenue. Uh, if you change uh, you know, your glasses and look at it from the royalty farmer point of view, uh, what turns out, you could draw a similar curve for them, mm -hmm. and what you would find is that the odds for incurring a loss of 7%. Notice, if they had invested, just had gone partnering, share, sharing profits and uh, costs and uh, revenues with Sunesis, they would have been looking at, if you fix the design, they would have been looking at a 41% odds of making a loss. It's come down to 7%, and you can see that stopping for futility, for example, and not investing, things like that have done this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the external internal rate of return is uh, is a good uh, 22%. So the risk return profile here is what would attract the typical investor. Typical investors otherwise see a huge return with a huge risk. So you know there's a very small chance of making a huge amount of money. Essentially, look, they, they look at other investments where there is not that sort of uh, huge need to take a risk, plus the lumpiness of the investment. So, so this is just an illustration with this hazard ratio, but I think it brings home the point that we can, and this is to Frank's point, that it's not that these numbers just fell out of the air. The, it was the negotiation was a back and forth with a tool like this, which allowed you to do a what if. So if we do this, what about that? And looking at these curves going back and forth enables the convergence then, where so both as a win-win situation comes through. Yeah. Uh, so this, so I thought I'll wind up with these comments from partners. Uh, Pablo Legoreta, CEO of Royalty Pharma, uh, says the adaptive trial design offered them an opportunity to invest. He, uh, sort of, uh, he's very clear about it, and he says it resulted in a win-win for both Sinesis and Royalty Pharma. Uh, Stephen Ketchum was one of the main drivers of this design and this arrangement for financing. The senior VP R&D at Sinesis, 
uh, said that it's difficult to imagine going forward with these the traditional methods, like I think traditional designs. <coughs> the native, the practical design provided multiple favorable scenarios that allowed us to proceed with our pilotic study. So it was clear that they were uh, they were able to find a way to meet, uh, to get the investment and uh, go forward with the compound that they had in a more uh, safer way of developing it than they ha would have if they didn't have the funding. Uh, one last point is to say that uh, just uh, in reality, the trial itself, the valid trial, is just coming to a close. It's, it's in final stages of closing. And uh, you'd be curious to know that uh, what happened at the interim, what really happened at the interim was that they indeed went into the blue zone, the promising zone. They did find that they had been a bit optimistic about the 0.71 as a ratio, and they, to give themselves some safety margin, they increased the sample size. So it's, it's an interesting uh, surprise in what actually happened. So with that, let me hand over to Frank again with the second case study, which is for a larger pharma company. Right, and I'll go through this pretty briefly because actually a lot of the themes are things that I think we've talked about in the earlier, but it's really just a complementary case of how to pair adaptive trial design and financial analytics to help in decision making. Um, so in this case, <clears throat> we, we were working with a large pharma company to explore um, how this could help reach better decisions um, at these at funding uh, at funding junctions, and you know, specifically, I think that for these early, we decided to focus on something that was ready to go into phase two in a niche oncology indication, sort of like the prior example. Um, and what's interesting about those is there's a lot of them, especially in oncology R and D organizations. There are a lot of these situations in which. You have some early stage asset, it has some width of activity, there's a reason to believe, and yet the opportunity size is likely small, and there's a lot of risk. There's not that much known about the underlying uh, disease. Maybe you're the first in class in that, uh, in that particular mechanism. The linkage between the mechanism and the, and the tumor type is okay, but not great. Um, so overall, it's perceived as a low POS, low value situation. And I think what happens in many large R&D organizations when they have a portfolio of these, that there are a lot of these types of programs that end up almost in the portfolio promising zone, so to speak. You know, they're, they get intermediate priority within the R&D organization. They're not the things where the head of R&D is saying, yes, let's, you know, let's go straight into a phase three trial and just take it all the way. They're not getting killed. They're kind of on life support. And often there's very little basis for having a discussion about what the right way is to go forward strategically with these, short of, I think, what's the most common solution to this, which is essentially sort of death by starvation, you know, which is, well, you're a second tier program, so we're going to give you only half as much money as we would. Do your best with half as much money. Um, so we were really interested in sort of using one of these prototypical cases, prototypical assets to really explore, could we actually provide a little bit more of a nuanced portfolio suite of options, so to speak, that had different implications in terms of cost, risk, time, and reward? And could we do that in such a way that it would potentially be useful for our teams to have those conversations with senior management to be able to really work through the various options? So let's go to the next, uh, uh, the next slide. So this was the base case design here. And <clears throat> again, we can quibble over, over the specifics. The fact is that, as any of you have been in large uh, pharma know, um, typically there'll be put some stake put in the ground in terms of kind of a base case sort of linear design. And this one included doing a pretty standard uh, phase two uh, analyzing the data and then going on and sort of starting again from a standing start, a new phase three trial based on whether one was feeling good after the phase two. Um, this had a certain cost and time associated with it, and it had a certain probability of success. Now, <clears throat> probability of success in this context is just important to know, especially for early stage assets, as again, many of you probably know, probability of success is kind of a class-based. It's not linked specifically to this design. It's more of a kind of strategic and experiential and benchmarking kind of, uh, kind of decision. 
so this trial had, again, a time, a cost, and a nominal POS associated with it. And we were really working to answer the questions of what are the other options that could be attractive on various parameters, although probably not attractive on all of those parameters at the same time, and what are the trade-offs both between those parameters and the trade-offs with the expected quote-unquote value of the asset. And I should point out here that one of the other things we discovered, not to get ahead of the story, but in working through this with a large pharma company, one of the things that we discovered, which in retrospect is obvious, is that in an R&D organization, you're mostly managing a budget. You're not managing value. Um, you're told you have $100 million to spend on a portfolio of assets and go spend your money and get things to work. Whereas when you go up to different, higher levels in the organization, and certainly when you get to the CFO, the CFO is interested in value. He's not just managing the cost side, but also managing the return side of the equation. That's something that an R&D organization often kind of butts up against it's kind of late in the game in terms of uh, getting things over the transom. R&D says, well, you gave me $100 million, and here I'm progressing all of, these, uh, all of these assets. And then all of a sudden it gets to the point where you need a big investment in a phase three trial, for example, and someone says, hang on a sec, there's not that much value. So this does sort of push the value discussion earlier. Um, so as in the prior example, there is an almost infinite number of ways that one could design different um, trials here. We actually decided to focus on two potential goals and work, ba and work backwards from those goals into trial designs that could help achieve those. So when one of them, the goal was actually to maximize the actual value overall of the program. And the other was to shorten the amount of time to the first get out in order, in other words, to tie up money for the least amount of time before we knew whether we had something promising or not. And there could be other goals. The goal could be to um, get there faster overall, the fastest overall. The good goal could be to uh, you know, do as well as we can while keeping total costs within, um, within a given band. Those are all valid as well. We chose the, these two to do the analyses, and Nitten's team um, developed two different uh, variations on adaptive trial designs that would help us to, to accomplish one or the other of these goals. And then we did the financial analysis as well as the statistical analysis on those to basically figure out how we could compare them to each other um, and how we could communicate that comparison to senior decision makers. So. <clears throat> This is what happens when you actually um, analyze those, and what you find is that in the maximized value situation, what you've essentially done is you've bought probability of success and value. Um, you've gained a little bit in time, um, but what you've, what, what you've spent, quote unquote, is you've spent the amount of uh, money you're going to spend before your first get out. Um, in the second one, where the goal was actually to shorten the time for the first get out, that's what you bought. You bought the shortest amount of, uh, of time to the first get out. In fact, less than half of what it would have been in the base case and, uh, and significantly less than what it was in scenario one. But you've done that um, with an expense of not really improving the overall probability of success of the program very dramatically. Now, Again, there are a lot of different ways you could go with this, um, and one could have many other scenarios and variations on these scenarios. But I think the important point that we came away with from this is that this type of table, looking at these types of metrics, is actually the way to have a conversation that bridges the gap between financial and portfolio decision making on the one hand, and strategic decision making, making on the one hand, and R&D and trial design on the other. Where now everybody is talking the same language and what you ended up doing is you've enabled decision makers and external and, and internal investors, I'll talk about external investors in one second, but you, you've enabled the investors and the decision makers to basically say, well, that's interesting, you know, what I really like about scenario one is, you know, I love the fact that I, have, that, I, that I get more value. Is there a way to do something like that where we actually could spend a little bit less overall? You know, because that would really, because now I, and you can start to have those kinds of conversations, whereas without doing adaptive design and pairing it with financial analytics, 
the finance people, and we've heard this many times from senior finance executives, view the entire clinical development process essentially as a black box. If they're just handed something to vote up and down on, and they have no idea sort of what the different levers are and what impact they have. This actually gives some transparency to those levers. Um, I just want to make one additional small point, which is that, as we talked about right at the outset, this case was intended for really an internal decision maker and financer, but essentially it's the same argument when you were, if you were to have a conversation with an external financer. Um, that, and really understanding what are they the most interested in? Are they most interested in the total value? Are they most interested in, you know, constraining how much money they have to put to work? Are they most in, interested in maximizing overall POS? What is it? And that's going to be somewhat idiosyncratic depending on the particular investor. But by doing this type of analysis, you actually enable that conversation to happen. I just wanted to add one more point there. I may, uh, was uh, recall when we put these numbers together, Frank, so the uh, ENPV, it's interesting to see the change in the ENPV, and that came from actually three factors. One was the probability of success. If we look at, for example, base cases in scenario one, that's to be explicit. Uh, the large increase in ENPV came from three factors, increasing the POS, reducing the time to market, and also reducing the cost, just as the time would suggest to you. Uh, and we found that really it was interesting, the cost, and this is probably obvious again afterwards, the cost plays a very negligible role. But the other two roughly broke up, at least in this case, uh, one third of the uh, improvement from the base case came from the POS, but two-thirds, the larger chunk, came from time. And that's yeah. kind of interesting. I don't know how generalizable it is, but it's an interesting yeah. uh, kind of I think that's an excellent point because, you know, many times in large farm organizations, you'll have people say there's a value to being faster. But very rarely do you actually see someone calculate what is the value? How much would I pay to get there a month earlier? And how much am I giving up in POS? Exactly. And how much do I give up in terms of probability of success? And how do those things fit together? Actually, is a conversation that only gets held at the vaguest levels. Um, you know, just to clarify here, the, I first get out. That's the point at which you could decide not to fund anymore, um, in case that wasn't clear from the previous. So essentially, in scenario two, where you're shortening the time to first get out, essentially you have the shortest window um, before you can make the decision to just stop if it's unpromising. Um, good. So I think that's essentially the end. And I just want to come back and sum up the, these before we open up to questions um, to just sum up what I think Nick and I agree are kind of some of the key, the key issues here. Number one, there's fundamentally a, what we hear is that there's fundamentally a disconnect from between both internal and investor, external investors on the one hand and the R&D organization on the other in terms of really what the interplay is between trial design and, finance, and key financial parameters. That's one of the reasons why R&D organizations often struggle to effectively communicate and get senior buy-in for, uh, for their tr proposed trials. It's also one of the reasons why you see very little investment from the external financial investor community in individual trials as, a, as distinct from uh, assets or companies. Um, so we think one of the big takeaways here is that, um, and what we hope we've presented, is really the power of being able to integrate both trial planning and the analysis of key financial metrics so that there's uh, a conversation that can happen between both parties. The second issue is really this discussion, I think highlighted best in that last case example, of what is the key variable in this case. And often, um, I think in small companies that often is pretty well known what the key variable is, or that tends to surface more quickly. In larger companies, sometimes it's a little more obscure. Are we managing for value? Are we managing for cost? Are we managing for time? Um, regardless, when you bring external, uh, when you bring investors together with R&D folks in the context of doing adaptive design and the financial analytics, again, you're empowered to have that conversation and to be able to iterate the uh, trial design process on the basis of what comes out of that conversation. And then finally, and most importantly, um, 
again, not to beat a dead horse, but clinical development is a tough business from a financial point of view. And I think that um, that's recognized very acutely both in large organizations and in small organizations, as well as in the financial investment community. And we actually think that by doing this type of analysis like what we presented here, you can actually create new investment, um, more, new forms of investment that actually make it more attractive and can be matched with different types of investors, whether those are external or internal. Anything you wanted to add as we close up? And I just up? wanted to add, ultimately, I really do feel uh, there is there's real value to be obtained if we could connect trial design to the financial outcomes, uh, because I think uh, the adaptive designs allow so much more flexibility and allow exploring a whole lot of you know, financial risk return trade-offs which were not there in fixed design. Uh, this is a new opportunity, and uh, but it calls for really bringing together these uh, two groups which uh, don't uh, often communicate in the same language. My, my sense is that a great deal of value, uh, especially to justify adaptive designs, I think we would be able to do that much more readily if one could frame it in this way, especially when you go higher up into the portfolio levels or the program levels, I think it would play a big role. It's literally impossible to do without it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So the questions. Yes, and hi, uh, this is Mike White. I'm the marketing director here at Cytel, and I've been monitoring your questions of uh, the online audience, and we're just about to pose those questions to our guests, Frank and Nitten. Um, I did want to say, though, first of all, thank you for everyone <coughs> today for joining us, and remind everyone that the, the close of the Q&A session today, you'll be asked to fill out a very, very short survey, but uh, rest assured that your input will be shared with Frank and David and the development team here at Cytel. So we do have some very you know, pointed questions, albeit very short, um, that we would really appreciate your feedback on. It really helps to shape our thinking, uh, both in terms of the topics that we're engaged here and also to think about what other topics going forward um, this audience would find uh, useful uh, going forward together with the, uh, with the DIA and such as on webinars. I will remind everyone, too, that everyone here will receive um, by Monday an email from me with the link for the replay of today's webinar, which will be free, provided by the DIA, and also a link to today's slides. And we encourage you to freely share those amongst interested colleagues. Um, so let's get to, uh, to questions uh, right away. We've had some, some good ones come in, and a lot of questions, uh, Frank, and, and then from slides 11 and, and 12, um, where a number of folks asked about the relationship between the uh, probability of success and, and changes in the hazard ratio. Uh, one uh, specific question uh, comes from, uh, from Andrew Hartley, and Andrew asks on slide 12, is not the, the, the probability of success of POS, um, is not the POS unless you are certain of a particular hazard ratio. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about the relationship between changes in the hazard ratio and a um, probability of success. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I agree. It's, uh, it's uh, the uh, uh, this curve here is actually about the power at various hazard ratios, and I call it a probability of success because I wanted to pave the way towards, uh, for example, what we did in the second case where we uh, used a Bayesian prior to link together. Not, not, we did not design Bayesian trials. Trials were all traditional frequentist trials. But when we analyzed financially and looked for probability of success, we had a prior on uh, true hazard ratio, for example. Uh, and so you're right, probability of success does not necessarily translate in a simple way uh, <coughs> It, it may require combining hazard ratios to come up with a uh, probability of success. And uh, specifically, uh, we have a question just came in 
wanted to know about how exactly the interim analysis is is managed. Uh, the the question is: Is the interim analysis done by an independent DSMB DMC with the sponsor blinded? And how was this interim decision communicated and implemented? Yes, in, in this case, uh, it was indeed uh, there was a DSMB and. Uh, uh, there was a no member from the sponsor group, the DSMB, and they were given, uh, there was a charter which was, uh, you know, uh, specifically laid out for them, and uh, the only people who could look at the data were the, there was an independent statistical uh, center, uh, which actually did some of the numerical work, but then eventually it was uh, taken to a statistician was a member of the committee uh, to interpret it for, for the rest of the DSMB members. And uh, they made the decision independent, absolutely, as the sponsor. They did recommend to the sponsors about the promising zone I talked about. And uh, the, the uh, sponsors did decide to go along with that recommendation. It's specific. This is Richard Rhodes' question that I just posed to you. And, and uh, Richard also wanted to know, is that interim decision by the independent committee, is that binding upon the sponsor? It's not binding. It is basically a recommendation, but typically unless something goes very wrong and so, you know, something very unusual happens, and therefore the, the committee has to make some ad hoc uh, decisions which are outside the scope of what the sponsor had in mind. Uh, it's not likely to happen. That is, if you have a trial in which things, if you have looked at all contingencies, uh, and I mean primarily efficacy related to contingencies, uh, the committee tends to go along. Although, although I would just add that you know, whether you're talking about an external investor that obviously is interested in the integrity of the data and the integrity of the, of, of, uh, of the decision making that comes after that, or whether you're looking at a quote unquote internal investor, um, you know, that it ends up being pretty important because you need to both have confidence that, that, that there's integrity there. And also you will have presumably had this pre existing conversation about what you're going to do in various cases, sort of like what was what's shown on uh, on slide thirteen with the in this Nice example. I think that sometimes ends up being a little bit of a challenge in larger organizations where part of the delay that happens between phase two and phase three is kind of waffling about and trying to decide, well, what do we think it means? What do we want to do? Maybe we feel better about it. Maybe it didn't come out quite as well as we thought, but we want to go ahead anyway, et cetera. So I do think that one of the one of the kind of cultural challenges here, but also an opportunity, is really to have a much more data-driven conversation about, you know, before starting the trial, about what do we actually think success looks like? What do we think promising zone looks like? What do we think unfavorable looks like? Where I think often those kinds of conversations are delayed if they happen at all in large organizations. And of course, the, the regulators are very keen that uh, there's certainly quite a lot of work done by uh, the Adaptive Design Scientific Working Group I mentioned. Uh, uh, they have a, put out a paper just in the, in the last uh, issue of uh, the DIA Journal, the, the new name I forget now, Therapeutic uh, uh -huh. Regulatory Science, I guess, uh, on, on, the, uh, on these aspects of controlling uh, how does the DSMB control the uh, forward, uh, forward movement of the trial. It, it is an important area, but uh, it's not like uh, I think there's a good deal of light shed on it, and there's a good understanding of it. Uh, there are still issues about, uh, so even like forecasting when would the interim occur. Uh, 187 events is fine, but people have to gather at the right time, and so you know, how do you get at least approximately there? And, you know, can you get all these busy people uh, in there? So there's a lot of management involved, and there's also the uh, issue of uh, uh, the, the, the trustworthiness of the result because has the data been touched by anyone who touched it? What happened? Yeah. The trust element, and there's the integrity element. Was it uh, was was access controlled? So, for example, in the Synesis trial, uh, we had a special software to control access to the data. So those are the sort of things one would have to put in, and that's why the 
uh, adaptive trials don't, uh, you do have to work hard to make adaptive trials work. Uh, and it's a challenge because not just the nature of the beast, but because of the fact that it involves uh, multiple disciplines and the cross, you know, cross functional teams. But, but it has been done. Fortunately, experience has built up to the point where it is possible to look at people's uh, charters for these uh, uh, DSMBs and to learn from them and adapt them to our needs. And then you mentioned uh, uh, a little bit about, uh, you touched upon a, a question that uh, our friend Sandeep Menyon has from Pfizer, and, and Sandeep asked a little bit about how was the, the situation, the decision making by the committee, how was that firewalled um, so that the decision did not, uh, was not known, you know, that the data analysis um, and the decision making uh, was communicated to only those who had the, per the charter, had the right to know the access to that information. So Cindy wants to know how was that actually, how was that actually firewalled per the uh, firewall FDA unit guidelines? Yeah, they, the FDA guidelines do say that the firewall required for this kind of design, the sample size, the adjustment design, is probably needs to be stronger than what is adequate for a group sequential design. Uh, and that we, in this particular case, uh, Saital did uh, uh, did develop a software uh, which has uh, strong control, uh, has strong control over access. So it's like a banking system where you can't just go and look at data, uh, person's uh, balances and so on. Uh, so that that would be uh, the existing systems may not be adequate to show uh, that you have not only to do it but also to show that you've done it through audit trails and uh, that's one of the concerns that uh, FDA does have is that one is you may have a SOP that it won't happen but. How do we know it didn't happen? How do we do we know who is there access control which is strong enough for us to believe? But in, in this case, we we have to uh, we have to get to that kind of uh, system in place to do the interim. Now, here's something a little different. Uh, Barry Kress asked, in, in general, can you predefine adaptive design criteria on safety endpoints? As opposed to the more frequently seen quantitative efficacy endpoints, so is you know is there an, is there a potential to define you know a well-defined safety endpoint? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know certainly in theory you can. Uh, it, I, th I think in principle you want to define an endpoint which informs then the risk at the you know going forward. And in the cases where we gave, the key risk was seen to be an efficacy risk. So essentially, the reason to have the interim endpoint was to manage efficacy. But you could imagine a scenario in which for a particular drug or particular therapeutic area, that really the big concern is around safety and you want to get an interim read on whether you've surpassed a certain safety threshold or not because you're pretty confident that, you know, you're more confident on the efficacy side of the equation. And I think that it would look virtually, it, it would look very similar to the kinds of things that we presented here. I think it just depends on, is that the, is that the dating, quote unquote, investment decision um, in terms of going forward and continuing the trial? So for example, in these large coronary trials where sure. uh, heart disease trials are using very large samples, uh, you, you, you would want to probably put in some futility boundaries to sure. make sure you don't carry on with the trial after it's clear that the safety is an issue. Yeah, or if you're in some therapeutic area in which there's a certain organ toxicity which is just very difficult to model preclinically, but you're, but for whatever reasons, because of the target, because of the patient population, what have you, that this is, that, that this is clearly a no-go for you if it, if it gets to a certain, if it's surpassed a certain level, then certainly. And of course, some of the, you know, the DSMBs do have it in their charter typically that uh, if safety occurs, they have the right to call the trial to a halt uh, for patient safety. And so if it's not something... Right, I was going to actually raise that just, you know, it seems to me that a lot, that safety is usually monitored somewhat on a I'm not sure... Now that I think about it a little bit more, in many trials, it would seem that you're already monitoring at least some subset of safety. So I think the question probably gets to, if there's some discrete element of safety, you know, that we know that X is a risk, and if we saw even 
two of those, those might not stop the trial for clinical reasons, but we would stop it for strategic reasons, you know, then that, I think that's where you would potentially use this kind of approach. Uh, from the pre-questions, um, everyone who registered um, um, had the, uh, the uh, ability, had, were able to uh, ask some questions ahead, ask a question ahead of time. Um, and one person raised the, um, wanted to know a little more about the critical role of simulations in assessing the pros and cons of an adaptive approach. Um, maybe we have glossed over a little bit and taken simulations uh, for granted. In uh, So when we look at these the tables that you presented and hazard ratio versus a probability of success versus making decisions as to you know, where the optimal a path is maybe you could talk a little bit more about the role that simulations play in determining. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't think adaptive design as a whole. It's hard to conceive of uh, designs with where you could uh, avoid doing simulations. It's, even for simple trials, even non-adaptive trials, I think you often should be using simulations to see what if conditions. If some things don't work out according to assumptions, you can't often get formulas. You need the simulations. And that's, that's one of the things that one has to uh, worry about in adaptive design is that do you have the right tools? Uh, do you have the time to really explore properly uh, the various ramifications of adaptive designs? Uh, simulation, for example, plays a role also, not just in the statistical aspect, but uh, often drug supply can be a big concern for adaptive designs uh, because the, because the uncertainty, uh, for instance, in this uh, Sunesis trial, what happened if you stopped early? Do you just throw away the rest of the drugs, or do you plan so that you have batches which uh, you don't have to have if you were, if you stopped at the interim? So, and it, it becomes even more complex when you get to uh, changing of randomization ratios and so on. But it's very hard to predict what the ultimate demand would be, uh, and typically overages are higher. But there again, simulation is a tool which enables you to get a get a handle on, on that. And I think also just from the financial point of view, you know, if you look at this kind of probability as a function of revenue type of curve, you know, it's essentially being able to generate that by doing the simulations and being able to figure out what the shape of that curve is as opposed to just getting the average value is really central to the to better decision making in terms of investment because you know, a lot of investors, you'll see if you read the investment literature, people will talk about things like a 5% value at risk, for example, which is in the worst 5% of cases, how much am I going to lose? Mm -hmm. And that number often gets glossed over unless you've gone through and done more of a simulation that gives you that the, the probability curve like what you've seen here, you can't really get at that question. Now again, the 5% VAR may not be the driver for every, in every decision or for every type of investor, but some aspect of the shape of the probability curve in terms of what these outcomes are likely to look like when you run these large number of simulations um, is really at the heart, I think, of how investors tend to think about this from a financial point of view, which is somewhat different, I think, than from how R&D organizations often think about these questions. And Mark, as a follow-up to that, what, what, what advice might you give um, biostatisticians and, and others in planning trials about speaking with investors, outside investors, or, or internal investors, um, stakeholders in the trial? Yeah, so I think it's two different questions. So I think if you're in a company where it's primarily a quote unquote internal investment question, I think there's a degree of socialization of these ideas that needs to take place. And you know, this work that we did, we really sort of saw as a first step where we used some theoretical kind of uh, trials that were closely aligned with situations the company had been in in the past and really used those as the first step to sort of testing, being able to have the conversation, what's important, what way of seeing the information is valuable to you, what, what aspects of this actually helps you to feel like you're a better decision maker and you're making more informed decisions that are just better for the program, better for the company, et cetera. Those may not be the same at every level of the organization as well. So, you know, for example, you know, for better or for worse, if you talk to someone who runs an R&D organization, 
what we found was that sometimes they're not as interested in the value piece because, to the point that we talked about before, they're trying to manage a budget. Yeah, that same conversation at the CFO level, they're very interested. So, you know, I think there's some of those com some of those issues are somewhat context dependent, and I think that what you what's needed as a first step is really to do some of these and and start that conversation, and then you can kind of figure out what's right, quote unquote, for your particular organization. For an external um, investor. I think it's a little bit more clear what, because their value, you know, it's, it's a little bit more clear what the parameters are that external investors are interested in. That doesn't mean that external investors as a group are homogeneous. We talked about, you know, Royalty Pharma was the investor in this case. They're going to have a very different profile in terms of how much capital they want to put for, to work, for how long, how much risk they want to incur, what kind of rewards they're expecting, than maybe on the other side a company that has that, that where most of their portfolio is an early is an early stage VC and they may want an investment that looks more like that. Alternatively, maybe they want to use something like this as a way to de-risk the rest of their investment portfolio. And they say, well look, we have a lot of, you know, swinging for the fences kind of investments where we're expecting 10% probability. Maybe we can kind of you know, tamp it down a little bit and have a couple of base hits in there and maybe we're viewing this more as a base hit. So again, I think that it's a little more clear how you'd have that conversation, but there still needs to be some sort of iterative process um, in terms of the investor conversations as well. And, and then maybe you can share just a little bit in your own journey um, of becoming more engaged with the financial side of drug development, maybe some, something that, that you could impart from your own journey about speaking the language. Well, I think one of the things that I've noticed is it is very hard, to, hard. For example, I've had this discussion with uh, Mike Krams, who uh, you know, has published or used one of the, many of you may know him as a sort of pioneer in terms of actually implementing adaptive design. Uh, he has got three case studies. Yeah, but this was when Wyatt was an uh, independent company, not as part of Pfizer, uh, where they, it was, they talked about the success of these adaptive designs. But every one of them was really actually a failure. In other words, these were early stoppage where the success was you avoided spending so much money. But my question, of course, to Mark, uh, to him was that, uh, Mike Rams was that, well, what is, so, so you saved the money. Well, one is not so great that, you know, you just get losses. But then presumably this money could go into something which could have been a success. And so what is the value? So what is the opportunity cost? of using up funds, or pushing a drug as opposed to opening in the funds for other drugs. I think that's a very key element, and I'm just, I mean, that's what, you know, what Frank referred to, this uh, portfolio perspective is kind of an important perspective, because you don't catch the perspective at the project level. At the project level, project doesn't get brownie points for stopping early. The brownie yeah. points actually go to the organization as a whole because they've now got the resources to do something. Yeah. But the point that I think is worth remarking here is that at least uh, I've heard uh, uh, Jerry Schindler of uh, Merck uh, say that they have been able to get the late stage trials. 40% of their late stage trials have stopping for futility group sequential rules. And they want to up that number from 40%. So that's, that's to me quite a, uh, but that speaks to this value of the opportunity cost of stopping early has registered there, and therefore they're so Right, which again, the more explicit you make it, the yeah. more I think it's likely to work. Yeah, and I think when you're talking to internal investors, that's a very clear value proposition, right? Like I can put my capital. In fact, when you look at the uh, when you look at the example, we're looking at the time to the first get out, for example. If I'm looking at my portfolio and I realize, well, in 20 months I'm going to have to make a big decision about whether to fund some other trial, then yes, I'd like to know before that whether I also have to fund this one or not, um, you know, trial A or not. And that has massive implications potentially in terms of budgeting, in terms of how to, how to allocate total resources. Um, and again, on the external investor point of view, slightly different. Of course, there they also have the choice to invest their money in other places. So there is the, the same meta point. I think it just plays out a little bit differently because obviously the investor is investing trying to get a return, not investing trying to lose as little as possible so that they can move on and put their money somewhere else. So it's kind of different psychology. In fact, I, I'm, I'm just to 
say a few words. I, I've been sort of working with the models for precisely that, where I think one of the key things in portfolio is that you don't make the decisions, unlike, say, financial portfolios, you don't make a decision on all the assets at one time. And right. again. Here they come and go. They may not even come because if you're looking at late stage, which I was looking at, uh, something at early stage you may expect will come in two years that doesn't. And so you now have a chunk of money you know, sitting around. What do you do with it? So it's, it's not that people don't do it, but I think there is room for a good quantitative picture, which doesn't necessarily give you the optimum decision, but give, calibrates and gives you a chance to think about uh, what exactly, you know, ask some what-if questions. Uh, it's, it, again, it amounts to the same thing. It needs to bring these two groups together to sort of share insights and data and understanding. In fact, I have one question about that for you, Frank. Okay. It sounds to me like that it might be worthwhile to try and actively put together some sort of a workshop or seminar. I don't know what the format would be, but I would say it was a workshop possibly. Where we try to actively bring these two, two groups with that together, and we have some case studies, some real, some hypothetical. Uh, I don't know whether the time is right or it's kind of uh, you know, yeah. too early to try and uh, persuade people. But. No, it's an interesting question. I mean, I'd be curious to get feedback even yeah, from the people who are on it. If anyone has any thoughts on that when you fill out your uh, your surveys, please let us know. I think that, um, again, I think there are the meta questions in terms of sort of more broadly getting the ideas out there, and then there are the more sort of micro questions about in an individual organization, how do you get the right people in the room together? To uh, to move things along, and probably one needs both. Yeah, you need well, you need the case studies, but you yeah. also need to yeah you know to sensitize people to what's happening. And that's yeah. often the case studies happen, but they don't. Yeah. Just, you know, it takes a long time for that to come into kind of the public, uh, the general perception, and uh, absolutely. So. Well, we're going to finish up today's session with uh, two questions that appear to be at least to me to be related and. Uh, they're going to come from Ian Zhang and uh, Julie Dietrich. And uh, Ian asks, um, and this is a uh, follow-up to a discussion about uh, use of simulations. Ian asks that uh, given the FDA having concerns regarding type 1 error, uh, the high error, uh, type 1 error rate um, control is important to, um, to the FDA. Um, when um, determining this using simulations, um, how do you control the type 1 error rate in simulations without analytical proof? Well, at least uh, in this case, both these cases, the, the, it was theoretically controlled. We did not rely on simulation to provide that. Also. I'm not suggesting that that's the way it should be, but we, we told the FDA guideline, basically. But one thing is there, that for early stage, of course, and I think that's phase two, those finding studies, uh, I believe uh, it is not uh, a requirement that you don't use simulation-based results uh, to uh, lay down cutoffs. In other words, at the end of the study, the analysis cannot incorporate some value which has come out of the analysis and not theory. So here you'll notice that I, I didn't refer to it, but I mentioned the PHW method. The PHW method is a theoretical method. In fact, it's a bit conservative, which guarantees uh, type 1 error control. Now, one could think of, well, it's conservative, so why not use simulation? Uh, this is an interesting study. I mean, this is a question which has been going around. I think, uh, uh, I, I don't know how it's going to end, but this is a state, state it is. Uh, there has been a clear indication by the FDA that they will not accept simulation studies. On the other hand, if you look at the, the devices division in FDA, they do accept simulation-based studies. So that itself suggests that Maybe there is room for some such movement. Actually, in September, the DIA, and, uh, the FDA, and uh, the ASA are having a workshop in which one of the sessions is on how do, how do regulators look at simulation results. So, be interesting to see what comes out of that. Julie Dietrich, uh, I think we'll, we'll we'll conclude today. Um, with Julie's question, and, and Julie raises concern for studies with objective endpoints. If the sample size is increased, a signal is sent that the study drug looks promising, uh, which could increase a placebo effect and mask treatment response. Um, 
would you know is that a concern that uh, that either you have seen or or, or have it experienced with? I mean, I think that you know in general this whole in another context, this whole signaling question I've seen raised in the context of social media, actually, where people are talking about trials that they're ongoing um, with potential skewed results. I mean, I think in general this is a that this is a fraught area, and I think Nitin and I have talked about this before, that there are clearly therapeutic areas in which there is a historic, a well-known high placebo response already where um, I, don't, I don't know that adaptive trials add, any, add dramatically more uh, to that problem than already existed, um, but certainly they don't help either. I'm not sure what you think. Yeah, well, I, I like to think of it in two ways. One is, if you look at the adaptive design gu guidelines of the FDA, they, they say that uh, group sequential studies are uh, well understood, and uh, they welcome people doing them, and not necessarily having to explicitly get approval of adaptive design, which is the case for not so well understood studies. Uh, and if you look at group sequential, it's also the case that you know you can tell something about as soon as the trial proceeds further from some point, you can tell that it, uh, some extremes have dropped out, something like this. There is some knowledge, but, but I think the general feeling is the information is so small <clears> that it doesn't influence very much. And the other thing is you'll notice that, I'm glad you brought this point up, because if you look at the Sunesis design, there's very deliberately, if you look at the, the, the part that is remaining after you take out the stopping early for efficacy and stopping early for futility and the promising zone, it's a mixture of two things. It's a mixture of good and bad results at the interim. So the fact that you, if you're in that zone, you don't really know whether you've got a good or bad. So that's, that's uh, it, all I'm saying is that there is definitely some information that is known that it is. Sufficiently in, in the reasoning? No, not to be uh, worrisome. But uh, certainly for good sequential, the FDA seems to be quite happy with, uh, with the fact that it's okay, it's working. Yeah. Is it safe to say that if a sponsor follows the existing EMA FDA guidelines for an adaptive trial and the proper firewalls and the use of committees, and the guidelines are out there, that these concerns can be, can be managed? Yeah. But, but I still think that if you're not going to have some of the very traditional adaptive methods. It's funny to talk about traditional adaptive methods. <laughs> like group sequential, it seems like uh, it's uh, well known. Well, well known, yeah, well known, well, well understood. Well, it probably is okay, but if you're not, then it's probably a good idea to get uh, you know, to get the FDA into the discussion, especially the pivotal trials. If they're not pivotal trials, I think it's really up to you to make sure that you're not going to see yourself. Well, if uh, the response to today's webinar is any indication, um, this is just the beginning of the, the, the process of moving um, clinical development from belief systems and paper-based and um, traditional web methods uh, to a new era, and some people have um, referred to it as an era of the, of the model-guided era of drug development, and certainly these are some of the early steps toward that, and we see some more, more savvy sponsors and sponsors of all different sizes. We talked about both larger companies that have internal uh, financial concerns and smaller companies and biotechs for the most part, which um, look to outside investors and that, those relationships. So it, uh, if this is any indication of the interest here, we'll be talking about this um, for, for quite a, this is just the beginning. So I'd like to thank um, Nitin. Patel from here at Cytel, Frank David for Thomas Jones for their um, participation today. Uh, I can remind everyone that you can find out more information and continue the dialogue with either Frank and or Nitin by visiting our respective websites. Um, Frank is the principal uh, at PharmaGellant.com and it simply is PharmaGellant.com where you can easily reach Frank to continue uh, the discussion and using the contact us here at Cytel.com, uh, we'd be happy to forward any um, questions that you have to Nitin as well. So with that, I will thank our host, the DIA, 
um, today for today's webinar. I will thank everyone for participating, for joining us today. We look forward to engaging you further. And thanks once again to Nitin and to Frank. And we wish from Cambridge Mass, everyone, good day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, everyone. This concludes today's webinar.